Hi, I'm Susanna Proudman and I'm a rheumatologist. I'm going to demonstrate examining the hands for inflammatory diseases. First, it's important to ensure that you've adequately washed your hands before introducing yourself to the patient and telling them that you are going to examine their hands and wrists. Then ensure that their hands and wrists are adequately exposed and check in whether the patient has any pain. When you first meet the patient, you'll have had the chance to observe their general posture and demeanour and to see whether there are any walking aids or splints to indicate whether other joints might also be involved other than just the hands and wrists. A four more detailed inspection it's useful to assess active range of movement to gain an impression of any overt deformities or functional difficulties. First, ask the patient to make a fist to assess full flexion, then turn the hands over to assess pronation into supination, which gives you an indication of range of movement of the elbow joints as well as the wrists. Flex the elbows fully, giving you the opportunity to inspect and palpate the olecranon on bursa and the ulnar border of the forearm for psoriatic plaques, rheumatoid nodules, and gouty tophi. Then ask the patient to assume the prayer position to assess dorsiflexion of the wrist, and then reverse into palmiflexion, ensuring the forearms are as close to parallel as possible, and comparing the two sides to see if there are any restrictions of movement. Then inspect the hands in more detail. Firstly, assess for any deformities suggestive of rheumatoid arthritis or osteoarthritis, and then examine the dorsum of the hands in more detail for rashes, scars, and nail changes it may be very important and an indication of other systemic diseases such as psoriasis or scleroderma. Then ask the patient to turn the hands over to inspect the palms, looking for wasting of the thena or hypothena eminences, and palpate for Dupuytren's contracture, which causes thickening of the palm of fascia. To palpate the small joints of the hands, place the index finger and thumb of your non-dominant hand over the joint to palpate in a vertical plane and the same fingers of your dominant hand in the horizontal plane. The aim here is to assess the joint for inflammation by palpating the joint margins for tenderness, heat and swelling, whether it be soft tissue swelling consistent with synovial hypertrophy or effusions which are most easily felt by palpating in the two directions. Palpate the joints from right to left if you are right-handed or left to right if you're left-handed. It's easier to start from the distal interphalangeal joints, then the proximal interphalangeal joints, including the interphalangeal joints of the thumbs, and then follow this with the metacarpophalangeal joints. Examine the metacarpophalangeal joints in full flexion to assess whether passive flexion is both full and pain-free. You can also assess swelling of the MCPs in this position and it makes it easier to palpate the joints by palpating in the groove between the head of the metacarpal and the proximal phalanx. Remember to compare the two sides. When palpating the wrist, there are two joints to palpate, both the radiocarpal and ulnocarpal joints. And it's easy to complete this examination with passive flexion, both into dorsiflexion and palmiflexion, to compare for subtle restrictions on both sides. Then palpate the flexor tendons with the thumb of the, your non-dominant hand in the palm, while flexing the digit fully to assess firstly the flexor tendons for swelling, tenderness, nodules and triggering, and then to assess the passive range of movement of the fingers at the proximal interphalangeal joints and the distal interphalangeal joints. Next, we examine the sensory and motor function of the peripheral nerves in the hand, the median, radial and ulnar nerves. 
When examining the sensation, compare the radial three and a half fingers with the ulnar one and a half fingers. These are the median and ulnar nerves respectively. And remember to compare the two sides. Assess radial nerve sensation over the first dorsal web space. Examine the power of the radial nerve by assessing finger extension against resistance. For the ulnar nerve, examine finger abduction against resistance. And for the median nerve, ask the patient to turn their hand over so their palm is facing upwards and to position their thumb over the midline of the palm. Ask them to keep it in this position while you apply downward resistance with your own thumb. And you can compare the power of this movement with those in the other directions. If you find signs of median nerve compression suggesting carpal tunnel syndrome, you can perform special tests looking for changes in sensation, particularly in the radial three and a half fingers reported by the patient. Tunnell's test involves percussing over the volar aspect of the wrist over the carpal tunnel and Phelan's test involves forced flexion of the wrist. In both instances, these need to be performed for at least 30 seconds to be sure that they are negative. And lastly, you assess the patient's function. Firstly, you ask them to remove the lid from a jar, enabling you to get an idea of how strong their grip is and whether they have good rotation. Then ask them to remove a key from the jar, holding it in a pincer grip and pretending to use it like a lock in the door, again to assess rotation. Ask them to repeat the test using the other hand. Having completed the examination of the hand, you can now ask yourself the following questions. Is this an inflammatory condition? If so, is it currently active? And what are the consequences of this inflammation? And finally, you may have some idea as to the cause of this condition, as you may have identified extra articular features that are evident in the hands and upper limbs.